welcome this morning to read, reflect, pray. We're in Colossians chapter 1 as we continue to look at Paul's prayers. So let's read together Colossians 1 and verse 9 to 14. Colossians 1 and verse 9 to 14. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray for God's help. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have your word. Thank you that we can open it and hear it read. And we pray that as we look at it, it would open up to us your will. And that it may equip us to live that life worthy of you. So Father, please help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you use the internet, but you know if you do... You have that button that you can press on the internet search browser and it will instantly reveal the desires of your heart. So if you want to know what you're passionate about, you want to know what you're maybe aiming at in life, all you have to do is hit this button on your internet search browser and it'll tell you. It it will reveal in a matter of seconds your heart because it's the search history It's what you've been looking at over the past week, over the past month. And it may reveal what drives you. It may reveal what you're really interested in, what you're really passionate about, what your preoccupations are. And the Apostle Paul, he didn't have the internet. He didn't have a search history. But you can tell from these verses and from his prayers what he is passionate about. You can tell from these verses what, it, what makes his heart beat. And so we're going to look at this prayer in Colossians 1. And we have simply two points. We're going to look at and see the aim of the prayer, the goal of the prayer. What is the end that Paul is praying for, for these Colossian Christians? And then the content of the prayer. So the first thing is here, the goal of Paul's prayer. And you could summarize it by saying the goal of the prayer is that these Colossians live sustained, effective Christian lives for the glory of God. That could be a summary sentence for verses 10 to 12. Look at verse 10 to 12. And we pray this in order, (coughs) that you may live or, or live a life or walk worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. I don't know what your aim is or what your goal is when you say your prayers. Our, Our prayers may not be like Paul's. They may be God bless this or God bless that or God bless him or her. But Paul here has something bigger in mind. He has a bigger vision. He has a bigger goal. And he wants to see great things in verse 10. He wants every one everywhere to look at these new believers in Colossae and to be able to say of them that They walk worthy of God. They please God. It's as if he wants these Colossians to have a quality control stamp against every part of of their lives. And the quality control stamp says pleasing to God, 
pleasing to God. These Christians live in a way that brings a smile to God's face. That's his prayer. And notice in verse 10, the every. He wants the Colossian church to be fruitful in every good work. That it's harvest time all of the time. In verse 10, he's longing for the Christians to be actively growing and developing in all their knowledge and understanding of God. In verse 11, he wants them to be empowered with all power. He wants them to be enabled. It's power-assisted living, isn't it? I came across the, this prayer. Um, <clears throat> it, says, it says this, Lord, dear Lord, so far today... I'm doing all right. I've not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I've not whined, cursed, complained. However, I'm going to get out of bed in the next few minutes and I'll need more help after that. And the point is, it's not, it's, it's not easy being a Christian. And it's not easy being a Christian in the, world, in the world that we live in. With some of the issues that are going on today. And to be a Christian is to be so countercultural, And so that's why Paul prays that you need strength, verse 11, with all power according to his glorious might. And he goes on, notice, he goes on, verse 11, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Paul wants us to be more than flash in the pan Christians. I don't know if you've been to uh, maybe a, a, a firework, maybe, you know, <clears throat> Liverpool are, are champions of England, uh, and rightly so, after 30 years. And perhaps you let off a few fireworks, perhaps you, you got the flags out, perhaps you had a social distance party, and you were celebrating Liverpool's great victory. <clears throat> but sometimes being a Christian is like those fireworks. They look fantastic, there's a huge explosion and there's dazzling showers of light illuminating the place. But once it's all over, you're left with a sort of deep smog. You're left with an aroma, the sort of a faint lasting smell. And Paul says, Colossi Christians, you're not to be like that. You're not to be flash in the pan. You're not to be like a firework display where you're sort of all go and then it just suddenly fades and you're left with that faint aroma. He wants it, we praise, he wants them to have great endurance and patience. In other, in other words, he wants them to retain their cutting edge. That through thick and thin, they keep going. He's not just interested in them starting well. He wants them to continue as they started. And he wants them to go on and to finish well. In the, in the 17th century, there was a young believer called Mary Durant. Who lived in France. <clears throat> and at the age of 14, she was told that she had to deny her faith. She simply had to say the words, I renounce. I renounce, but she refused. And they placed her in a tower where she lived for the next 38 years. All she had to do to get out of the tower was to say, I renounce. She would gain her freedom. She would continue to live her life. But she didn't do it. And apparently, you can still go to that tower today. And on the wall, in the room where she was, there are words, I resist. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Enduring with patience. I resist. She kept, kept going until the end. B.B. Warfield, a very profound Christian thinker, a very clear thinker. When he was on honeymoon with his wife, she was struck by lightning. She was paralysed for the whole of her life until she died 39 years later. And B.B. Warfield, in the middle of his ministry, his lecturing, his preaching, his writing, he never left home for more than two hours. 
And every day for 39 years, he patiently, privately cared for his wife. And that's what Paul is praying for here, for endurance, for harvest time all of the time, for patience. And as you look at verses 10 to 12, wouldn't you like those verses for your own individual Christian lives? Wouldn't you like them for our marriages, for the house that we're living in? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be an amazing thing if, if all around people were saying of, of this church, there is a church and they're authentic and they believe and they behave what they believe and they're walking worthy of the Lord. And that's, so that's the aim. That's the aim. That's the big theme, the big aim of, of Paul's prayer for these Colossians. And then secondly, the content of Paul's prayer, the content. <coughs> Look at verse 9. Verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that leaves us asking an important question about verse 9. <clears throat> and it's all very well Paul saying, you know, we, we pray that we're filled with the knowledge of his will. But what is this will he is talking about? What is his will? And people have suggested all sorts of things, some more spectacular than others. And here he's not talking about personal guidance, about whether I should take that job or this job, whether I should marry this girl or that girl. He, he's, not, he's not talking about should, should I sell this car and buy this car? That's not the issues Paul is dealing with here. He's talking about something that is much bigger. He's talking about something that is much grander. And he goes on to talk about it here in verses 15 and following, and especially verses 19 and 20, where he reveals to us what is God's will. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's God's will. Paul is talking about the big storyline of the Bible. Paul is talking about that God made us. And he made us with a purpose to know him. And he sent his son to redeem us and to dwell in us. And that people from all the nations, <clears throat> people from estates in Exmouth, slums in Calcutta, the inner city of New York, the vast rural tracts of Siberia, from small towns in Albania, that people everywhere would come and be redeemed by God and Christ Jesus, and Christ would dwell in them. And that's what Paul is praying for. He's praying that we would be gripped, that the Colossi Christians would be gripped, and we would be gripped by his grand, rich, glorious plan. God dwelling in us through Jesus Christ. And with the express purpose of bringing us all to heaven the new heavens and the new earth. That's God's will. He's saying he wants our minds to be so filled with a deep understanding of what God is doing in this world that we are enabled to walk worthy of the Lord. And I hope you can see that here. And this is a really relevant prayer. This is what we should be praying for, for a whole new generation. That they may know what God's will is. 
what God's grand purpose is, what God is doing in this world. He is reconciling all things under Jesus Christ. And this is what we should pray for as we meet together. That we are caught up, that we are gripped, that we are thrilled by what God is doing in this world. That he is working out his great grand plan of redemption. And that great grand plan of redemption applies to every part of our life. And that's why we're keen as Exmouth Chapel that people tune in to our services. That's why we're keen to invite people to our church when we reopen again. That's why we're keen to, to share this with children and teenagers and all generations because as we understand and get a better grip of what God is doing in his world his saving purposes being worked out then we will walk worthy of the Lord as our minds are filled with the knowledge of the will of God we will be enabled to walk worthy of the Lord we will walk in line with God's will. We will please him more. We will bear fruit. It will be harvest time all the time. We will find that our priorities are rearranged. And we'll begin to ask more, what is God doing? How can I walk in his ways? And the more I understand what God is doing, the more my behavior will reflect that. So that's Paul's prayer. There's, there's a lot more to it. But we're going to leave it there. There's some prayer points on the, the, the email that has been sent out. So please go through that. There's some questions to answer. And I, I would encourage you, of course, obeying social distancing. Please feel free to meet up with other believers out of the fellowship. Listen to this talk together. Answer the questions together. Discuss it and pray together. I think that would be a, an, an amazing, marvellous Thing to do so please do that you can wait for the sun to come out uh, and do it in, in your gardens and, uh, and I hope that you can plan to do that let me pray for us and then we'll be finished let's pray Heavenly Father we ask that this prayer of Paul's would shape us that we would know more of the knowledge of your will and that that would with the enabling of your Holy Spirit and your mighty power, would help us to walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.